525. Psalm 8411 and Jeremiah 525. If you take notes, I've entitled the message Bumps and Blessings. Bumps and Blessings. Thus saith the Lord, Psalm 8411, No good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. And Jeremiah 525, Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. Before we look in these two verses, let's pray and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to open up, open them up to our minds and hearts. Spirit of God, we thank you that we have these wonderful verses, and we ask you to open up our minds and our hearts, and help us to do more than listen to them, Lord. Oh God, help us to realize that this is your word, and it's a, the living word. Living in the sense that we're to take hold of these words and what they mean and, and implant them in our heart and in our life and in the lives of other people. Would you help us do that? We know it's your will. And if there's one here today who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, God, today pray that you might stir them or even call them to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Oh, God. We pray that you would do that. And also, Lord, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to walk amongst us and open up our minds and our hearts to the text and the preaching of the word. And let it bring us edification where it's needed, comfort where it's needed, even conviction, Lord. If it's needed, bring it to us, Lord, that we might, we might walk closer to you in all things. Help us. And then be glorified in it, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Two verses. First verse, no good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. Very simple verse, just says, um, you do that, you do, if you walk with God, then and you walk uprightly with God, then nothing will be withheld from you. And then the opposite of that in Jeremiah 5:25. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. Now, first, let me tell you this, that the text is not addressed to the world. It's addressed to God's elect people. And in these two verses, we see the demonstration of how God's government works in our lives. And it's very important because, believe this or not, you are under the government of Jesus Christ. Your members of his family. Uh, I think it's in Romans chapter 8. It says that our spirit testifies with the Holy Spirit that we're the children of God. That we're the adopted children of God. We are adopted as God's elect children. And in that, in, and in that we have entrance into his household. I think it's in Ephesians 2. 19, it says, now we are members of the household of God. So we're under his government. A wonderful thing to be under God's government. Oh, wonderful, as you'll see. But first of all, you must understand uh, a simple thing. There is a distinct difference between God's government and God's decrees. There's a difference between his government and his decrees. And by that, I mean divine decrees refer to God's sovereignty. When he's talking about things that he decrees, it's his sovereign will being, being, uh, being put out there. But divine government is different because divine government deals with man's responsibility to God. We live in his house. We're called his children. We're told how to behave under the governmental rules of God. Unfortunately today, doctrine, God's doctrine, has uh, lost much of its flavor in the evangelical church. You don't hear about doctrine too much in church. 
There are more churches today, the evangelical church today is more interested in population, programs, ecumenicalism, and tickling ears, being censor secretive. They're all interested in bringing them in, bringing them in. Whatever you have to do to bring them in, bring them in. So doctrine doesn't bring people in. This church holds, I guess at one time we had, we had some concerts. We never used the top, but I guess this church would probably hold 150, 200 people with the top maybe all together. It used to see it back in the 1800s perhaps. No more. The echo you hear in this church is here because we teach doctrine. That's not an evangelical modern church thing to do because it doesn't make people seeker sensitive. Or it doesn't, it doesn't tickle their ears, I should say. For us, for as God's children, we're, we have commands that we follow. And the command we find in 2 Timothy 2.15 is the command to study God's doctrine. Study to, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a very simple thing. It's written in the Greek imperative tense, and it means it's a command. Study. It doesn't say read. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, well, it does a few places, but the command in the New Testament is to study the Bible. Why do you think that is? Because in studying the Bible, even Jesus said it to other people. You think, you, uh, uh, I think he was talking about, uh, you think you know the law, the law speaks of me. And that's what he was talking about. Read the Bible. You read the Bible, you'll understand who God is if you're saved. And because of that, we should know the difference between God's decrees or his sovereignty and his government. And understand in no way, when I say that, in no way am I suggesting that God's eternal purposes is ever changed by man's uh, behavior. We don't do anything to change God. God is immutable. We can't. Malachi 3.6, for I, the Lord, do not change. He's not going to change. Nothing we do or don't do has any effect at all on the divine plan. Nothing. The only thing that changes, the only thing that changes in God's government is man's blessings or his lack of blessings, his bumps, blessings and bumps. And you know what? I thought of that title. That's really what life is in the world. This is, I'm, I'm speaking spiritually from the pulpit about this, but in the, in the contrary wise, in the world, isn't life really blessings and bumps? Don't we do that? Isn't that the highway we travel on? You go through life and everything is good, it's a blessing. But all of a sudden, something happens. But boom, there's a bump. And now I got to deal with a flat tire. I got to deal with a broken something or other. In the spiritual realm, it's exactly the same thing. But now you're under a different government. When you're in the world, you're under the government of Satan, the prince of this world. You'll find that in Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3. But now you're under God's government. And there are blessings and bumps here as well. And unfortunately, I have to say this morning that many of God's elect, I'm talking about believing Christians, live in spiritual poverty. Many believers live in poverty. They're nominal believers. They're people who suffer from fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, et cetera, et cetera. They don't know how to grasp it, how to grasp God's power to get out of it. They don't know how to do it. And so they go through their life and, 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 they, and they make it to heaven because they're saved, but they go through this life actually eating uh, from the scraps of the, of the Lord's table, from this book. They can only get so much out of it because there's so much that they have to get rid of and nobody's showing them how to do it. And they're not showing them how to do it because they want to draw people in. But if you want to know how to do it, then you have to understand that God's word will show you how to do it. And, the, and the, the, probably the worst thing is that their poverty isn't limited to living in this world. If you're a nominal Christian and you've been saved for any length of time and you're not bearing fruit for your father, if you're not doing that 
and you go home before you bear a lot of fruit, that's going to that's gonna mean that when you get to heaven, you're, you're not going to have anything to offer Christ for what he did. Do you not remember that Jesus said, I have come that you might bear fruit, much fruit for your Father in heaven. That's our job. That's our duty. One of our duties is to do that. And we do that by understanding God's word and not letting the things of this life cling to us and hold us back. And God wants nothing more than to free those bonds. He wants to get the cuffs off. He wants to get the chains off. Why? Because he loves you. You know, uh, back in the day uh, when, when people were raising kids, you know, they put them in these little things. They used to call them play pens. You know, they had like little bars on them. I used to think they were like, looked like little jail. The kids are holding on to them like this, you know. Uh, and, and that's what we do in spiritually speaking. We let this, this world and the things of this world hold on to us. And God doesn't want that. You can't be happy. You can't enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. You can't even produce fruit for your Father if you're chained. You're not chained with God. You're, he's your master, but he took the chains off you. There's no fear. There should be no fear in your life. There should be no, no anxiety. There should be no unbelief. Granted, you're human, and sometimes we fall into those states, but they shouldn't be something that's holding you back. In the last month, I've talked to people who are being unchained after being chained to years to different things, knowing the Lord, but being chained to Him. So important to understand that, that God is more interested in your spiritual health than any other thing, and in your and you being joyful. He wants you to be joyful. He said, I have come to give you a peace, even my peace, that you're, that you're, and my joy, that your joy would be full. Peace and joy. He came to give you all of that. How are you going to enjoy peace and joy if you're chained? How are you going to enjoy peace and joy if you're walking around this world and you're, yeah, I'm hanging in there. You're not hanging in there. He hung in there. It's difficult. There are things in life that are difficult to get over, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all. I'm simply saying that you have the power. I can't tell you how many things, and you probably know yourself, when you first got saved, things that chained you down, and you decided, you purposed in your heart like Daniel, when he purposed in his heart not to eat from the king's table, I'm not going to do it. And God influenced the eunuch to say, okay, I'll give you some vegetables to eat, but if you get sick, you're going down with me, something like that. But the point is, he did give it to him, and God blessed him. He blessed him. Why? Because he stepped out of the boat. He stepped out of his comfort zone. He said, I'm not going to be chained to the king's table. I'm chained to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did the same thing. We're not going to honor your God. Our God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're not going to do it. How about that? And what happened? Because they stepped out of the chains, they went into the furnace. And when they went into the furnace, God was with them. And there's not one of you listening that doesn't have God with you right now. Take the chains off. Just take them off. Walk away. Simple. Living in spiritual poverty is not for all, but for many, a choice. Why? They're choosing God, yes, in the sense being that he called them and they belong to him, but at the same time, they're choosing to, do, to, to not do the things that they should do. They're not reading their Bible enough. They're not praying enough. They're not serving God. And you serve God. We should be serving God every day of our life, not just in church, but in our life. That's what Christians do. That's why he calls us bond servants. He doesn't call us bond, bond freemen. We're bond servants. We're to serve. He took us out of the chains. And now he says, okay, you're free. I'm giving you joy. I'm giving you happiness. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a, one cluster of nine different fruit that will make your life delicious. And he did. And he did. And the problem is, the people that he give it to, they keep picking up the chains and putting them back on. You can't do that. There's no, there's no, there's no profit in that. 
You don't have to do that. It, it, matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, you have all the power you need to bear all the fruit you need. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace, the word all means without exception, all grace abound toward you, 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 and you, that you always, having all sufficiency without exception, in all without exception things may have an abundance for every good work. And taking chains off your legs and off your hands, spiritually speaking, that's good works. Now you can bear fruit for God. And if you don't think, if you don't think that's true, just imagine this in your mind. Imagine being shackled by your flesh from guilt, shame, fear, negativity, whatever, and imagine they're really chains. And so you're walking around like this or like this, and you can only move your feet, I think, what is it, Joe, 18 inches to change the leg irons? You're only doing this, 18 feet. Hey, I want to tell you about the Lord. Somebody would look at you and say, well, maybe you better find uh, another another Lord because yours don't, isn't helping you at all. And that's what happens to people that keep themselves chained. They're not a good witness to God. And when they get to heaven, they bring the poverty they had here with them there. It's crazy. It's crazy. And 2 Corinthians 9 eight says, I'm giving you all you need. I'll give you all you need. And what about Philippians, uh, what is it, 4.13? I can do all things through Christ. And what about the other part of Philippians that says, God is working in you that you might work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He gives us everything. Why would God send his son to the cross to do all of the things that that cross did for us and leave us chained? Okay, you know what? You're saved now, but you know what? I know you're hanging on to all this other stuff. Well, just don't let it weigh you down too much. He wouldn't do that. God wants you to be free. Jesus said, you're my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. And what? The truth will set you free. And if it sets you free, then act like it and live like it and believe like you should. Now, a major point in God's government is this. It's important to understand, it's important to understand temporary and spiritual affairs. We're talking about the government now of God. Our temporary and our spiritual affairs are regulated by something other than God's sovereignty. Now, before anybody goes off on that, let me finish. <laughs> They're regulated by something other than God's sovereignty. God has established an inseparable, uh, inseparable connection between our conduct and, our con and its consequences. For example, when we're living righteously, God acts... Uh, towards us in a way that shows his pleasure in our righteousness, right? He shows us, uh, it makes him happy. And our text testifies to that. Our text says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So it's our righteousness that makes him happy. That's part of the government. That's how he's regulating us. He makes, he gives us the blessings when we walk in his will. Conversely, if you look at the second text, it shows us God's displeasure when we're unrighteous, when we're unrighteous. That is when we're not walking in his will. It says, your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. What he's saying is you've sinned against God and you're not going to get any blessings while you're in that state. Very simple. And I'd also point out that's a mistake to think. It's a mistake to think God's sovereignty rules over all his other attributes. We talked about that this morning. His sovereignty doesn't rule over his wrath. It doesn't rule over his wrath doesn't rule over his love. Love, wrath, um, holiness, perfection. They're all equal. There's not one that rules over another. They're all equal. Not like my fingers, be like that. They're all equal. And because they're equal, one isn't running the show. One isn't arbitrary over the other. They're all equal. 
or to think that God's dealings with man are only exercised by his supreme will. The, the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible clearly states mercy and righteousness are the primary ways God deals with man. That's his government. And here it comes. Romans 9.18. Although it's true, mercy is given by his prerogative. Mercy is given to us by his prerogative. Romans 19, there, he says, therefore, he has mercy on whom he will, wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. He does. We see that in Romans and so in so in a couple of different places. And so he gives mercy where he wants to, and he and he chooses who he wants to. He said, Esau have I loved, uh, Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. So in that in that specific thing, he has his prerogative. But the same isn't true about righteousness. Righteousness is not arbitrary with God, it's an eternal constant with God. He's always constantly righteous. God could no more suspend uh, the uh, no more suspend the operation of his righteousness or make it arbitrary than he could cease to be. He wouldn't be God if he did that. Proof verses for that abound. Let me give you a couple. Psalm eleven seven. For the Lord is righteous; he loves righteousness. Psalm 147, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. Psalm 97, 2. Righteous and judgment are the habitation of his throne. You see, in all these things, it's not God's sovereignty he's talking about, but his right, righteousness that regulates his interaction with man. And so when we're righteous, we're in tune with him, and it pleases him, and we have the blessings. Contrarywise, in Jeremiah 25, when we're when we're uh, when when we're in sin, we get bumps in our life. He puts bumps in our life to get us back to the blessing part. God established righteousness as an inseparable connection. Righteousness as an inseparable connection in determining how He treats His children. Don't we know that? Don't we understand that bumps are blessings? That means. And believe it or not, that means we're always losers when we sin, and we're always winners when we walk in righteousness. Always. You will never walk in righteousness and, and not be a winner, even if the world makes you a loser. If you end up bleeding all over the place, if you whatever you do in righteousness, it's that righteousness that pleases God, you're never going to lose, ever. In essence, in essence, if you think about this, God's treatment of his people is nothing more than a reflection of how we're treating him. That's what it means. It means that God's treatment, the way he treats us, is a, is a direct reflection of how we're treating him. Now, I want to tell you something about that. Think about that. Think about how God is treating you. And then look at it as a reflection. I, as a matter of fact, I said that to Wendy. I said, if you ever see me get anything other than the way I normally am, it's always a reflection. And so don't get angry. Just find out what it is and let's solve it. It's that simple. And if you do that, you don't have any problems anymore. Reflection of God on you is your reflection of what you're reflecting to him. So if you're in, if your life is as a child of God, and I'm speaking to believers, if you're a child of God, or because you're a child of God, if your life is like rolling, like unstable, it seems like you're always walking on this and that, and things seem unsettled all the time in this, you're, you're looking at your reflection of what, how you're treating God. You need to understand that. That's what's happening. So no matter what condition your life is in, if your life isn't in, a, isn't in a solid path, walking straight, yeah, you're going to trip a little bit once in a while and maybe wander to one side or the other a little bit. But if your life is, if your life is filled with seems like turmoil, with complaining, with negativity, with all of that stuff, you have to look at that as, your, as what you're doing to God. He would never do that to, to somebody who was walking in righteousness. He would never do it. That's a very good thing to take home today. 
Get a spiritual mirror. I told somebody the other day that, um, that we have to go out and we have to love God every day. Love God every moment of the day. And you know a good way to do that? First of all, you have to know what God's what kind of lo uh, love God wants. Uh, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. So what does that mean? It means every single day you go out and you're obeying God's commandments, make a note of it. You know what? When I when I when that guy when that guy just almost killed us both, I didn't get upset. I love you, God. That's one. We get to the grocery store. They didn't have it. I to they told me they had it. That's number two, Lord. I didn't get upset about that. You're loving God every day you do that. Every time you do that, you're loving him. And that's important for you to know because most of us don't know how much we love God. Well, I think, is it a warm, fuzzy thing? or is it? No, God only demands obedience. And if you obey him, if you put yourself under his hand, you're loving him. And the more you put yourself under his hand, the more love you have. The more love you have, the less bumps and the more blessings you get. People, it doesn't get any simpler than that. And it's everywhere in the, in the Bible. A proof for Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.30, two, five, six words. Those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. That being said, remember, you need to look in that mirror. Whatever's going on in your life with God, good, medium, or bad, I don't think I'd go any, any, I wouldn't divide it any more than that. Look at how he's treating you and then ask yourself, well, that's probably, or tell yourself, that's probably how I'm treating him. Change it. Become more righteous. Give him more time. Carry him with you throughout the day. Speak to him in your car. Have him help you pick out your bananas. Whatever you want to do, do with with God. And then watch what happens. And then look at the reflection again. And you're going to notice something. The mirror is going to be a lot clearer. The bumps are going to be a lot less. And the blessings are going to be a lot greater. And that's all it takes to do it. If you don't submit to God's will, you'll reap the bumps you deserve. Job 4.8. Even as I have seen those who plow... Iniquity and so trouble reap the same. Right? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity, equity rather, and so trouble reap the same. And our text backs that up. Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. So it's all simple stuff. I wonder how many times, think about this, I wonder how many times our unrighteousness has choked out God's blessings. Just choked it right out of us. We missed them. Jeremiah 2.9 tells us unrighteousness is not only evil. You ready for this? This is something I learned and it was so great. It's a bitter thing, it says. Jeremiah 2.19. Know therefore and see, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. He's talking to Israel, right? That's why sin is called folly. It's a crime against God, and it's a crime against ourselves. Did you ever think of that? Every sin you commit is a crime against God, and it's a crime against yourself. That's why it's folly. Why would you do that to yourself? Why? It's a personal crime. It's a personal crime because it prevents us from growing. It prevents us from prospering. And it prevents us from having a great fellowship with God. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. You can't do it unless this book is planted in your life. I don't know if you're growing a garden now, but Wendy and I are, and it's so neat. You see those little seeds go in the ground, and now we're seeing all these little, these little green things that look like little baby plants. And I guess they are, right, Wendy? So anyway... It's nice to see it, and that's what we have to do. We have to take the seed that's in here, plant it in here, and then let it grow down into our feet and, and show the world what, what we know. That's how you grow and prosper. And if you're living unrighteously with God, you're not going to do those things. 
when we submit to scripture, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, his blessings, all the blessings that come from being saved, that's not your reward. Your inheritance is God. Being children of God, that's your real inheritance. All the other stuff is just, uh, what do you call those add-ons to something? Not addendums, but they're, uh, I saw it in a dog commercial. A little, huh? Yeah. They're add-ons, okay? John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My father will love him and we'll come to him and make our home with him. God wants to, he gives you his spirit to live inside of you. And now Jesus and the father want to live inside of you as well. They want to live there. They're not going to live in the slums of your life if you got sin all over the place. Clean it up. He's given you the power of forgiveness. He's given you the spirit of repentance. Do it, use it. How many of you understand that? That you only repent because God gave you the spirit to repent. When you sin against God, you feel it in your heart. That's him reminding you, hey, buddy or lady, knock it off. Get over it. Come to me. Give it to me. Tell me your story, and then let's get back in the race and, and, and continue on. The point of that is when, when we walk in righteousness, God blesses us, and he lives in us. When you, when, but when we live in unrighteousness, what does he do? He replaces the blessings with bumps. For example, on a national scale, on a national scale, when Israel's cities were burned, God told them in Jeremiah 2.17, now listen to this, have you not brought this on yourself and that you have forsaken the Lord, your God, when he led you away? Hear what he said? Is there one sin that came on you by accident? Can you say you know, I was walking down the street, and all of a sudden, this sin just caught me by surprise. No. No, you brought sin on yourself. We all do that. It's called willful sin. We do that. And I'd also remind you about the book of Judges. I don't know if you've read them, but you should. All 21 chapters in the book of Judges testifies to Israel's continual idolatry and God's punishment for their unrighteousness. He punished them. They, 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 were, they, got, they were punished more, actually, than anybody else. I mean, you know, the, the outsiders, uh, they had their day after they left this world. But in this world, Israel really got punished because they wouldn't give up idolatry. But it's interesting to note that after they came out of Babylon, they never went back to idolatry. What did they do? They took the law and twisted it out of proportion and to make it what they wanted instead of what God gave them. And on a personal scale, unrighteousness brings the bumps of adversity into our life. John 5, 14. Here's a man that he met in the temple who was crippled for 38 years. And he tells us in his, in his response to this man when he helped, uh, after he healed him, why? See, you have, you have been made well. Here it comes. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. You know what that means? That means that that man was crippled probably because of a sin that he committed against God for 38 years. And it might say to yourself, well, that's a long time. Well, how about the guy that, that, uh, that was uh, walking along with the ark and he just touched it and lost his life? No, God does what he wants. And this man sinned and God used a, a crippled him for all those years because of a sin. Begs the question. And this, he's talking to somebody that was in the temple, so he must have been a Jew. So that begs the question, what is in our life? What is in our life that's crippling us? And how long has it been there? And isn't it time, after listening to this message and seeing Jeremiah, uh, uh, Psalm, the Psalm that in our text that says he's going to give you blessing, isn't it time to let go of the chains? Isn't it time to get over it all and stop being crippled by really our, it's really our flesh that cripples us. It's not anything, any, anything other than what you put in your head. Things happen to you, you can put in your head, it's, it was a horrible thing. I'm never going to forget it. Or you could say, you know what? I'm glad that's over with and I'm never going to think about it again and move on.
That decision is up to each and every one of us. That being said, there are some instances, there are some instances when the bumps in our life are meant to help us grow, right? James 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, I love that word, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. So whenever, whenever our faith is tested, it's not always from, from uh, chastisement. Sometimes it's growth. But because many of the bumps in our life, and maybe even most of them, they come because we wander too much into the little kingdom of I. It's the valley of the flesh, which is the valley of death. And God warns us. He warns us. If, if a believer wanders away from the narrow path, they'll feel the bumps of his chastisement. And that warning is clearly posted in Psalm 89, 30 to 33. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, talking to his people, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take away from him, nor allow my, faith, uh, my faithfulness to fail. That passage makes it clear God's chastisement comes from his love and their marks of his displeasure. Every time he, every time he chastises a child, he's doing it in love. It's designed for our good. It's designed to get us back from backsliding. Yet it's given to us because of our unrighteousness. Do you see the government of God is run by righteousness? Do you understand that? Or unrighteousness, his dealings with us. That's what it's that's the that's the two uh, the two corners of that. And then in Laminations 333, Ron, he writes, For he does not afflict willingly nor Grieve the children of men. He doesn't like doing that. The death of a saint, he says, uh, I take no pleasure in, in the death of a saint. Takes no pleasure in it. So help him out a little bit. Just chain. Drop the chain. And the reason uh, God puts bumps in our life, of course, is because of uh, his righteousness you can't have a God that's all those things that he is, righteous, holy, everything else. He will not tolerate sin in his children. For one sin, he condemned the world to sin. For one sin, Moses couldn't get into the, uh, get into the promised land. And the list goes on and on of just one sin. And when we don't repent of our sins, if you don't do that, he declares, I will hedge her up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. And that's Hosea 26, 2, 6 rather. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that, is that blessings and bumps in your spiritual life, are it's the governmental way that God deals with his people. And all you have to know, all you have to know is if you get right with God, you root out strongholds, you hate sin, if you study your Bible at home and you try to make every church Bible study and you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, if you walk with God, bring him with you everywhere, every day, and if you look at everything with spiritual vision, if you do those few things, the promise of Deuteronomy 39 and 10 belong to you. Even though it was given to Israel, you're still his people and it means the same thing. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and in the fruit of your body, and in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord to keep his commandments and his statutes written in the book of law, and if you turn to the Lord with all, the, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, if you do that. Now, I want you to look up at the cross behind me, and I want you to understand something. That is the epitome of two things. It is the essence of God's love and God's hate of sin. When you came to that cross and you accepted his blood and you accepted his government to run your life, and that's basically what governments do. 
then you accepted the idea and the concept that you were no longer chained, you were free. And you also accepted the fact that he has factory installed inside of you all the spiritual power you need to get along in this world, get victories in this world, and over the next. If you're not getting victories, then don't look to him. Look at yourself. He lives to give you the victory over your, over your flesh and over your life. Jesus started off by giving you victory over death, victory over Satan, he took the chains of bondage away from you. You're no longer bound to sin. You no longer uh, uh, do the will of the devil your father, who was your father. He's transformed you. He's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now act like it. We need to stop being cripples. We need to stop being chained. We need to stop making excuses. We need to say, okay, the Bible says it. As Sam Wigglesworth, a long time saint long ago said, if God said it, that's all there is to it. Period. That's what we need to do. And if you do that, your life will have more blessings than bumps. And the bumps you do get, they're just going to add to your blessings because they're going to help you grow. So I want you to go home thinking about something. I want you to go home thinking about that mirror, reflection. Your relationship with God and the blessings you have now is reflective of your relate, which, how you're treating him. He's doing the same thing to you. Get over yourself. Don't keep going back to the sewer. He put a nice white robe on you. He took the chains off you. He took the chains off your feet. Now stand. And the Bible says stand fast in your faith. Put on your light. Let everybody see who you belong to. And love God enough for what he's done for you that he wants to do nothing but put blessings in your life. Help him to do it. Just do what you're supposed to do. Love him enough to, to submit your life to him. If you're listening to this, all your life right now is nothing but bumps. You might think, well, I got a couple bucks in the bank. Everything is good. Fireplaces, uh, you can put that away. Saving a few bucks here. That's not a blessing. That's not a blessing. That's something that animals do in a different way, but they do the same thing. Time to den up. Time to have babies. Time to grow the babies up. Feed them. Get them out and move on to the next day. That's what people who are unsaved do. Your life's nothing but bumps. And the worst bump you're ever going to have is a speed bump when you leave this world and you're, and you're thrown into the lake of fire. That's the worst bump you could ever have because it's irreversible. It's irrevocable. And there's no time off. It's constant. It never stops. Now, People say, well, that's just your opinion of it. No, it's God's opinion of it. It's written in, uh, in um, Revelation 20. You can look at Revelation 20, 11 through 15. It'll give you all the particulars on that, especially verses 13 through 15. I want to tell you something right now. If you're listening to this and you don't know Christ is your Savior, I want to know what your problem is. Why would you want to live in a world like this, especially the world we live in now, where people are calling themselves things? Why would you want to live in a world that's that depraved and not have God by your side? Why? If you don't think there's a God, okay, well, then you'll find out the hard way. If you know there's a God, but you're just not sure if it's a, in the trees or if he, who he is, or maybe it's a she, or maybe it's something, it, whatever you think it is, the only way, the only book that's ever told anybody what God really was and proved it. It's this book right here. God is as real as the heart beating in your chest. Hell is as real as the rain outside. It's real. And you're on your way to hell right now. You're riding bumps. You're riding the bumps to hell. Un unless you come to know Jesus Christ as your savior. And that's such a simple thing to do. Most people that come to Christ. God lowers the hedge and you look at God and you say, wow, what did I do that for? Well, look, this is God and I, I sinned against him. You have to understand that you're a sinner and that you've sinned against a sovereign God and the only payment he'll receive from anybody is his son. So you, it says, no one comes to the father but by me. You have to come to Jesus Christ. You have to submit your life and say, Lord, Jesus, take me, save me, walk with me, live in me. And give me the life that I heard that preacher talk about. And he will. So if that's you, 
then you just, all you have to do is bow your head. You can do it in a pew. You can do it in a bathroom. You can do it anywhere you want. You just bow your head. And you come to God and say, you know, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I never knew it. Paul said, what I did to the church, I did in ignorance. And that's what we can all say. Because we didn't know God until he revealed himself to us, until he called us. And once he reveals himself to you, if you know there's a God, and don't start talking about the trees and the branches and, you know, all the other gods. The God of Scripture, he's the God. You got to get in touch with him, and you do it through repentance. You say, God, I'm a sinner. I need to repent of my sins because I'm so ashamed of what I've done to you. How I've offended you. Forgive me. I ask that in Jesus' name. And Jesus, while I got you on the phone here, I want to let you know, I want you to guide my life. I want to submit my life to you. And in submitting my life to you, I want to walk with you every day. I want to love you every day. I want to talk to you every day. I want to be your son. I want to be your friend. I want, I want to be everything, and I want everything to be you. I want you to do that. And if you're not saved and you don't do that, the option is very simple. I don't have to go into long detail. Hell is the, uh, the lake of fire and hell uh, in the original Greek language is is gives the idea of an enclosed space, very, very enclosed, very black. There's no light, completely black, filled with some sort of suffering. Some say fire, you say that if you want, but some sort of suffering that resembles flames burning flesh. The most painful thing in the world that can happen to a human being. It resembles that in a tight space you're going nowhere. You're never coming out of that space. And you're going to do that time for all eternity. If you want that option, then just walk away. And you'll get that option. But if you want to not get that option, and you want to have a better life now, and then you want to have eternal life with Christ, you got to live with him now before you can live with him later. And if you're not living with him now, you're not going to live with him later. Right, Vinny? So the fact of the matter is, you see me or call me after you hear what I just said. Now you're responsible for it. You call me or see me if you want to know how you can, you can um, invite Christ to be your Savior and you can change your life. I don't even need the rest of that song. So with that in mind, let's bow our heads and let's thank God for this wonderful message. I got a big blessing out of that. Let's pray. Father, when I thought of Bumps and blessings, it sounded a little, I don't know, Andy Griffith the type, and that's not my favorite thing, but God, you just opened it up so much when I was writing it. God, thank you for that, and thank you for opening it up to your people here, and even those listening online. And God, would you just please put it in our hearts to do that righteous check thing. Just help us look at how we're being treated by you and realize that's really how we're treating you. Help us to do that, Lord. And help us to keep score of how much we love every day. Help us to love every day, Lord, by being obedient and submissive to your and submissive to your word. We're under your hand. We're under your uh, we're in your under your hand and in your house and under your government. God, grant us the strength that you've given us. Give us the wisdom to use it to walk and glorify you with whatever time we have here that we may bear much fruit for one who's done so much that we can't even imagine. Thank you. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Closing hymn.